everybody knew what the Paul Goebel show and what Brian was, everybody would get this. Yes, and that it's, it's even especially special that no one will. <laughs> I've known him since the mid '90s, and I don't know what Brian was. <laughs> Nobody knows what Brian was. Yeah, <laughs> he's uh, <laughs> that's so great. All right, start the music, son. Oh shit! I'm sorry, I didn't have that uh, loaded up. Hold on. Yeah, you never do. <laughs> I know. <laughs> well, when there's three months between recordings, I kind of get off track. It's hard enough to remember what fucking day it is, uh, let alone to be all ready for my fucking 50-year-old out-of-date podcast. You just have to remember the song and you would remember what day it is. I can't remember either of those things. But it's Friday, Friday. I don't remember how it goes. Got to get down on Friday. I, I do know that. Yeah. Or I actually, oh, there it is. Or remember Melanie Chartoff. From Fridays. Right. All right, hold on. Very pretty, very pretty girl. Okay. Um, but I, I got a notification that you started following me, so that's how I knew, mm. Tom. It said, you know, Satan is following you <laughs> on Twitch. So, um, all right, are we ready now? Bust. Are you recording? Yep. You sure? I have been for a while. So. Oh, you got so you got all this good stuff. <laughs> yep. All right. Well, he's me, got the stuff. Let me start all over then. <laughs> Wait a bit. That's not starting all over. Perfect. God damn it. Go team dummy. All right. Uh, show. Yeah. Why can't I repeat it? Okay, I got it. He's got it, everybody. Here we go. Uh, it's not playing. So, should we just stop it? Nope. Start the recording. Start the Let's music. let it go. Keep going. Here's the music. Well, how much of this song do you want to hear? Any of it at this point. Any of it. <laughs> well, it's almost over. We might as well, might as well just let it play out. Your imagination behind the screens. There's a world built for you. It, and it, this week, it really is pure imagination. Take my hand and I'll point you in the right direction. The are you right singing along? What are you doing? Of TV. He's we can't hear the song, Paul. He's oh! In the, he's filling in the void. I, why, I didn't know that you... That's what I said. We can't hear it. I didn't hear you. I say that. Oh, this says your your screen sharing is paused for some reason. <laughs> did I share? I oh, did I? Okay, there we go. I must have accidentally paused. It's on. It's off. It's on. It's off. It's on. It's <laughs> off. All right. So how about now? Can you see it? Guess... Well, wait a minute. I scared it. I, I shared it with you, and you saw it. Then what happened? Did it turn off? No, I still see a picture of McNett and you, and you know. Okay. I see your screen, but we don't hear the song. I All see right. your Here. screen, and it's How about now? Nope. Yes, I still see the screen. But you, you don't hear it? No. No. It's a song of pure imagination. All right, hold on. Okay. Uh. <laughs> So I'm not sharing anything right now, correct? Yes. All right. It's typical for you. <laughs> All right. I want to share. Well, this, why can't I share both? Yeah. Yeah, these are good questions. Oh, I got it. Share sound. There you go. I got to click that. All right. Ready? Yeah, bust. Something we've all been waiting to hear. Behind the screen, there's a world of pure imagination. Behind the screen, there's a world built for you uh, and yeah. me. Uh, all right. Take my hand and I'll point you in the right direction. All right. All 
right. Now, there we go. Good job. Paul, did that did work? work buddy. Yeah. Excellent. You even did the right thing where you went right to gallery view. Good job. Yeah, I just closed that whole thing. I just nice. shut it all down there. Yeah. All cool. right. Best episode ever, guys. If we wrap it up right now, I agree. God. <laughs> hey, everybody. Welcome to the Paul Goebel Show. I am your host, Paul Goebel. We're back after a shorter hiatus than uh, the previous one. Um, but we're back now. With me, as always, is my co-host and best friend, Jim Bruce. Hey, everybody. Uh, you could recognize him by that awesome hairdo he's sporting. And uh, with him is uh, his co-friend and host guy, Tom Griffin. I'm the host guy. What's up, Tom Griffin, you host guy? Oh, now, just hosting around. <laughs> I notice now Jim once again has the uh, has a virtual background, yes. but I notice your background could be a virtual background, Tom. Like you could fool people into thinking that was a virtual background, I think. Do I do I need to prove it? You want to see me take a book off the shelf? Well, no, I believe it because uh -huh. I recognize it from your apartment. That Either I it's a real in. bookshelf or I just did a hell of a magic trick. That's pretty sweet. Have you seen those? Jesus. Things where people record themselves walking around on the virtual background, and then they'll use that as their virtual background, so it looks like they're walking around behind themselves. Yes, I have seen that. I like that. Yeah, I like it too. I saw the the funniest one I saw was a guy like comes into the room and sees himself and then leaves. But of course, the guy talking doesn't acknowledge it at all. Yeah, but it was in good. they use that stick. they use that in that movie that Zoom uh, horror movie. Yeah. They use that effect. Our friend uh, Allison Locke Nelson, who's a uh, brilliant writer, who is in currently in negotiations to get a budget for a thing she wrote because it's really good. Uh, she, of course, loves that movie because she loves she loves that kind of when somebody makes a horror movie with a low budget and really puts in the effort. And of course, well, that yeah. That movie, I mean, it was like I like I said long ago. This is the way entertainment is going to be for a while, and that movie is a perfect example. And it's done well. Uh, uh, and and the great thing is, years from now, that movie will serve as a perfect representation of what it was like, uh, not just to be creating things in this time, but actually living. People who say, people will watch that and go, wait a minute, you actually touched elbows instead of hugging? Yes, we did. That's how afraid we were. I think, and, I think our show is a better representation of what things are like now, because this is sad. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, because you can watch that show and think, okay, people could make things work. People could figure out a way to get by. <laughs> and that's not true. No, well, and also they had a better ending than we will have because uh, they all died and got put out of their misery. We'll have to go on when this is over. Yep. Um, well, let's talk about uh, the Emmys, which is just happened. Um, and I, I hadn't, haven't watched the Emmys in the past few years. I just check out the winners. And if I hear of any cool speech, I watch it. But of course, this year was fairly historic because it was the virtual Emmys and all that. And I definitely wanted to see how they pulled it off because uh, you know, everybody involved said, well, the biggest problem is all the technical stuff because sure. everybody's in a different location. The, the standing around and the camera work and all the shit happening there, that was the easy part, especially because there were a lot of people there. Jennifer Aniston was there. Uh, Anthony Anderson was there. Uh, Tracy Ellis Ross was there. So they, uh, Jason Bateman. So they were able to do those bits easily. But um, the, the, the hard part obviously was going to where everybody was at their house or hotel or wherever and, you know, waiting for them to possibly get the award or not. Right. Uh, I don't know if you saw, but the kid, the guy who plays Rami, uh, I, I think his name is Rami, uh, but on that show, Rami, you know, he was nominated for best actor and he didn't win. And he, sh and he, made, he took a video of that guy outside holding the Emmy walking away <laughs> because they had someone just like you saw them giving a uh, person in a radiation suit or whatever, handing the Emmys, they had one of those people at every location. Oh, that's great. Uh, just to make sure no one was ruined. Um, so I assume you guys didn't watch it. Uh, no, you asked me to do, make an effort. So I watched sure. a lot of it. And uh, I, I have an observation. I'll start with my observation, then you do yours. Okay. I watched Go Jimmy Kimmel's monologue and it was funny. And then I read the comment thread under his monologue because I watched it on YouTube. Okay. And there were a lot of conservatives just like, well, it's, 
good thing it was virtual because it wasn't funny anyway because they're <laughs> mad at Jimmy Kimmel. And it occurred to me, this I said this to Tom, Jimmy Kimmel is Bizarro Dennis Miller. <laughs> That's funny. Okay, good. All right, we figured it All out. Right. It might be funny well, to someone. But, I mean, there's a lot of reasons for that. I mean, case in point, do you guys know that Jimmy Kimmel ha is the oldest working talk show host on television right now? Jimmy Kimmel has been hosting his talk show longer than anybody on television. Oh, okay. So not the oldest guy, but the longest tenured. Is you exactly. talking, you, we, you've got to be talking network though, right? No. Conan. What, no. Well, Conan switched shows, not the same show. Actually, so that's, the had, that's the technicality you're, you're using? Yes, he's and he's Conan's had three different shows, which isn't really all that fair. Oh, I okay. see. And I see what you said. That's that's a reasonable thing to say. So the longest continuous hosting of a show. Gotcha. Yeah, a yeah. Single show. Uh, I mean, you could say the same thing about Jimmy Fallon if you're going to do that, right? He hosted late night long before he was on the Tonight Show. But my point is, uh, like you said, people look to Jimmy Fallon uh, not just as a as the host of the Man Show anymore. But as this reasonable voice, crazy enough, uh, because he's been so outspoken, um, obviously, uh, when he had his, I don't know, fourth or fifth child, somehow he grew a conscience when his kid was born with a birth defect. And he uh, realized that now that the bad things in the world affect him, he needs to speak out about he was, it. He was growing a conscience before then. It's just that that brought it into focus because he was already... Yes. Yeah, and, not, and, and to be fair, I, I mean, I know it sounds like I'm talking shit about him, uh, and I'll admit that, but I don't care. Whatever gets you to my side, I'm fine. I, I'm fine with that. I'm not going to criticize him for suddenly being woke, because uh, that would make me a hypocrite. But what I will criticize him for is being so shitty at it. Case in point, at the Emmys, uh, I don't know if you saw this, but uh, the, when they gave out the Emmy for Best um, Variety Musical Program, the nominees were The Daily Show, Jimmy Kimmel Live, Late Night with Colbert, Full Frontal with Samantha Bee, uh, and, and John Oliver Last Week Tonight, which won. Yeah. Uh, so they're all there uh, on their TV screens live. And Jimmy says, and you know what? As I look at it, I realize, uh, I realize Stephen's the only American here. Now let's just stop right there. What's the joke there? Somebody explain to me why that might be funny. Um, uh, he's addressing the elephant not in the room. Is that the joke? <laughs> exactly. I if anything, the joke is, hey, I'm an American, and I just noticed there's only one other American nominated, so I'd like him to win. A joke I've been hearing for four fucking years, and it wasn't funny ever. But now let's continue one second forward to where we visibly see John Oliver make a what the fuck gesture. He's an American. Because he has been a naturalized citizen for about a year now. Yeah. So now the joke doesn't even make sense. I'm, now, I'm pretty sure Sam B is too. Uh, very possible. But I mean, she might be both. But in any case, yeah, she's been here a long fucking time. So to say she's not an American is really kind of fucking rude, if you ask me. Good point, Tom. But now he's a fucking second grader, not even doing the most basic research for his shit-ass jokes. So then, of course, John Oliver wins and has a gracious speech where never once does he say, oh, and by the way, Jimmy, I'm an American, so fuck you. Nothing, he doesn't even mention it, right? Yeah. And, in, and, and what I hope is that somebody whispers in Jimmy's ear, by the way, John Oliver's an American if you want to, uh, you know, call yourself out for being a dick. Because he's got plenty of time to do it, right? But unfortunately, no, he fucking doubles down. Because John Oliver says, thank you, there's applause, and Jimmy looks and says, congratulations, John, but I'm definitely calling ice. Again, a joke that a lot of people have heard for the past four years, and I guarantee not one of them found it funny when someone told them they were calling ice on them. Yeah. Now, if it, and, and here's what bugs me the most about this ultimately, because that gets posted on YouTube and every knee jerk fucking conservative jag off Nazi racist asshole just immediately posts how Jimmy's dumb, even though he made racist jokes. Did you guys see the WAP one? Here's the other one. 
Did you see that Anthony Anderson bit? No. Uh, Anthony Anderson comes out to do a bit about what a crazy year it's been, and he lists off all the things here. Now, when you guys see that song by uh, Cardi B and Megan Thee Stallion written out, what do you say to yourself? What do you call that? Uh, you know what song I'm talking about, right? You wet ass pussy, right? Exactly. When you see that written out, is that what you say to yourself every time? Yeah. Okay, so even when it's written out WAP, yeah. you, read, you read it as wet ass pussy. Well, you know me. <laughs> Tom, what about you? Do you say that or do you say WAP to yourself? Uh, I, I, I guess I say WAP usually. Yeah, I do too. Well, as Anthony Anderson is going through this, he pronounces it WAP. And how do you know he pronounces it WAP? Because they bleep it out. So when he, it's clear he's about to say WAP or WAP or wet ass pussy, he says nothing instead. They bleep it out. And then Jimmy turns to him and goes, oh, are you talking about me? And they get into this back and forth because Jimmy Kimmel's Italian-American. Get it? Wow. Hilarious. Again, not only is that not funny and not cool and nobody wants to see it, but because you made the joke about uh, disparaging Italian-Americans, it got bleeped. So nobody even fucking saw the joke. So again, the fucking lack of research and the most basic preparation ruin two of these fucking bits that shouldn't have even been bits and what makes me the most angry is that other shit was funny jason bateman at the beginning was funny the idea that all the girls from friends live together in an apartment that made me laugh mm -hmm. there uh, uh the fact that like sarah snook and people had made their own emmys not the not to mention the fact that it was historic because shit's creek won you know, every Emmy it was nominated for. That was a huge deal, especially considering the kind of show it is and the people who are on it. I mean, it's unfortunate that it had to be a virtual Emmys and basically a second rate broke dick version of the Emmys. But I think, uh, I don't know, if I was Daniel Levy or any of those guys, I might've been more happier celebrating right there with all my friends and family and not having to deal with Kimmel's bullshit, not having to pretend he was funny and sit in the audience the rest of the night. Well, here, here is my, ultimately, I, I thought Jimmy Kimmel uh, was better than that. And, uh, and it's not just him. It's everybody who wrote on that show, uh, which includes people that we know personally. Well, you know what I think, though? So I'll use myself as an example. Uh, a number of years ago, uh, I got to write jokes for w some Webby Awards. And I remember that. Made, Lisa yeah, Kudrow had, hosted, right? Yeah, and she did not care for something that was written for her, which is very funny. <laughs> but so the thing about a show like that, we had a big time producer, a guy, the guy who produced it, produced, you know, Frank Sinatra, produced uh, Barbara Streisand, produced the actual Emmys, produced like the Academy Awards. So he's a very good producer, but he had four dollars or whatever. <laughs> and right. as a result, when you go into the room and you're filling time, which is all you're doing is filling time, is it's not just that you've got to write jokes. It's got, is you've got to write enough jokes to fill a long time under conditions that are not ideal for editing or cutting. So in Jimmy Kimmel's defense, I'm not saying those are good jokes. I'm saying it's probably the best you can hope for under these conditions because what normally would have happened is somebody would have went, well, it's WAP, not WOP. And, or somebody would have said, you know, that's kind of tired. So my expectations that were so low that I was like, okay, well, there's a joke that I found kind of funny <laughs> just because pre-production was probably crap. Whereas, no, you know, I, that I understand. Old, yeah. So I, I don't hold them to a very high standard anyway. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I, you make a good point, and, uh, and I, I do admit, for what it was, for all the things they got right, they deserve credit. Yeah. Um, but, but, I mean, ultimately, uh, this lays at the feet of Jimmy Kimmel, and he really doesn't have an excuse. The guy's been doing live TV for over 20 years now. Yeah. And to say shit like that and think it's funny just shows that he's a fucking hack and always has been. Well, uh, and he, he probably is. He's good at his job, though, and second pass at writing is the key, and I probably didn't have a second pass. Like, it went back when Tom and I would write, 
for the old trouser shock. Our best sketches were when Tom would go, uh, Jim, that ending don't make sense. And we'd rewrite it. <laughs> and that was always the best part was of course. after you got through. And that's us broke dick doing it for very little money, ultimately become, becoming the nation's favorite comedy group. But uh, <laughs> now you guys had a bigger budget than the Webby Awards. You had like $6, right? Or was it eight? Eight. <laughs> yeah. um, Tom, isn't it true you still have $8? Uh, well, I will when I get paid Wednesday. Oh. So. Yeah, well, when I get it, I'm going to buy something let's, sweet. Let's keep, let's keep making references to old videos, no one's seen. Hey, uh, 40 year old references. Jesus. Uh, um, well, that, I, I, uh, I, I was uh, hoping, well, here's the other thing I want to ask you guys, and then we can move on. I posted, because I'm in Facebook jail, uh, I wasn't able to post anything on Facebook about it, but I posted a thing on Instagram about it. And somebody uh, politely called me out and said, is this really such a big deal? And I had to ask myself, is it? I mean, I eventually said, yes, it is. It's a big deal to me. And I bet if you weren't a white man, you'd think it was a bigger deal than you do. Um, so I'm asking you guys, am I making too big a deal out of this? You're probably making more of a deal than it deserves. It, deserve, it, can des it deserves to be, no, not deserve is too strong a word. It's valid to discuss it. To, like in general, it's valid to discuss any art form, comedy included and go, you know, where I fall on, it always is funny first. Like, right. Well, ultimately, and I agree with that 100%. Yeah. If he had said something super funny that was kind of racist, and let's be honest, sometimes things are funny because they're racist. Right. And so, I, I always think of it as a scale. I always try to imagine yes, I agree. and I'm like, it's funnier than it is racist. And I agree. Then, but even then, after that, if you say it's super funny, but it is racist, it's still valid to question the choice to do it. It's still valid right. to question it. I think it's always valid to question it. Your level of vitriol is probably out of bounds. Not out of bounds. You be well, as bad but, as you want. But it's, but it's normal bounds. for me. Maybe not for the situation, but normal for me. And maybe that's something, you know what? Honest to God, I think I could just solve, fix your life. Oh, fuck. Put it Everybody, in an email, though, what you please. Do. Go, look. Maybe this seems out of proportion, but I'm always out of proportion. And then whoever's listening to you will go, oh, all right. Because <laughs> the thing is, I can't manage to get that mad about it because first, it wasn't that racist compared to a lot right. of things that are going on. It's yeah. contextually not that important. And Jimmy Kimmel at the end of the day is currently on the right side of history. Yeah. So and and really uh, ultimately he's a talk show host, not yeah. a, not a leader, but that's a good point because everything about me is out of proportion. My beard, my body, my hair, my voice, everything about me is out of proportion with everything else about me. So uh, I appreciate you pointing that out. They didn't fix my life, but it gives me a good excuse for it. <laughs> good um, excuse to call it. <laughs> yeah, a good excuse to call it what it is. Uh, uh, there was another thing about, uh, no, I guess that's it. That's it. Tom, did you have any thoughts about the Emmys before <laughs> we move on to this topic? No, I did not watch them. You, I'm, I'm on the record as not caring about award shows. Yeah, so. yeah. I mean, obviously it's TV, so... I'm into it. And well, then let's go on to my next point was about Schitt's Creek. Um, again, it's, a, his, it's historic because they won every award they were nominated for and almost every award in the comedy category, you know, including have writing. They been, have they won directing. anything before? Um, no, they've rarely been nominated. Is yeah. the thing. And it's partly because they're originally on Pop, which is a Canadian network. Even mm. though we watch it on Netflix or wherever, it's, a, it's originally on Pop, which is Canadian. So I'm sure there was rules about it. Like this season, first of all, all the Emmys they won were for the last season, which mm -hmm. nobody in America has seen yet. It's not available on Netflix. So, uh, so yes, it's a great show, but we're going to watch the last season eventually and go, oh my God, I see why they won an Emmy. Because yeah. we all know it is a fucking big deal. It's the last season. Um, but I think there were some hiccups there. But also, they, they're, the biggest thing they did – uh, to make sure they won is they didn't compete with themselves. They put Eugene Levy in best lead actor and Daniel Levy in best supporting actor, even though he's as much a lead of that show as anyone. Yeah. 
And if you look at the at the nominees, there's a lot like like Succession. Every dude on that show was nominated. So a lot of times they all cancel each other out. Yes, case sir. in point, case in point, uh, best reality show host. I don't know if you guys saw what was nominated for that, but four of the five guys from Queer Eye were nominated. Four or five of the six sharks from Shark Tank were nominated, plus Nicole Byer and a few other people. But of course, RuPaul ended up winning because all the Queer Eyes cancel each other out and all the sharks cancel each other out. And people go, who's Nicole Byer? Because they don't watch Nailed It. And of course, RuPaul ends up winning because he's fucking awesome. I don't know about you guys. That show is so good. I just, we just started watching it and I feel like a dick that I've taken so long to watch it. Are you're fine, but you didn't not watch it because you were like, no way is it good. You just didn't get around to it. You're fine. Right. That and and what's fun. funny to me is watching it now um, in, you know, a different political climate than it was then is interesting to me because um, I was, I just said to Brooke last night, man, if you're a racist and a sexist and you, and you love racist and sexist humor, but can't do it anymore go to a drag show man because they that's fucking that's half of what they do make fun of say make a bunch of sexist jokes because they're dressing up like women and then they fucking go a step and then they make fun of the asian woman and the you know and the, the brown woman and the super white woman and it's fucking hilarious and oh, okay so now i understand why you're finally watching it <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but my point is, uh, I guess my point is one of the things that makes the show great, unlike America's Next Top Model, which we just watched 22 seasons of, nobody takes it too seriously. Yeah, it's like when, like in, in the first season, there was one performer who was really good and basically said, I'm not being recognized for all my performances because he could juggle and blow fire and do all this shit besides dress up like a woman. And he was taking it way too seriously. He looked like an idiot. And he stuck out like a sore thumb. Whereas the, the best ones, obviously RuPaul's funny as hell, you yeah. know? And so you at least got to try to aspire to that. Yeah. And, it, and everyone's got their talents. Some are more funny. Some can sew better. Some are better with makeup, whatever. RuPaul. But they're all, they're all trying to hit that same point, which is just bottom line, super entertaining. And, and for, for what it's worth, this is one of the things I've always liked about RuPaul. And uh, going back to say my love of the kids in the hall is that they rhyme. No, it, uh, <laughs> back in the kids in the hall, when they would do sketches, and I've said this a million times, so I'll say it quick. Back in the kids in the hall, when they would do sketches where they dressed as women, I loved it because it was disturbing. They were disturbingly good looking. Especially Dave Foley. I see Dave Foley, you're like, damn, yeah. I want to hit that. <laughs> and I liked that because they made all this effort to create yeah. these characters that weren't just because they had to go beyond Monty Python, which was their inspiration. Right. right? Or it, it reminds me of Barney Miller when they would go out uh, uh, and dress up like women to try to catch rapists and mashers. And they never looked like women. And there was that one episode where they told Dietrich, never just forget it. You, you look so much like a dude, uh, just yeah. skip it. You don't have to do it. So RuPaul, when I look at RuPaul, I'm like, damn, she he's great. She's yes. great looking. RuPaul's a great looking tall lady. And I like all the effort that goes into it because mostly, mostly what do we like in entertainment is a little bit of fucking effort. Like try <laughs> to do the thing you're trying to yeah. do. Like when you do some live sketch and you haul a TV upstairs to create a special effect <laughs> that works a little bit and you didn't have to do that but damn it the people who saw it appreciated it because you made an effort so i'm not wait do you have actual uh proof that someone appreciated that yes i loved it oh okay <laughs> oh or or I guess, like i guess he does technically count as someone you when you make the effort to make a real shitty inedible sandwich to prank a dude on stage in hopes that he actually vomits in front of a live audience. Can I tell you something? So real quick, <laughs> real quick story first is that the, what Paul's referencing is back when we were in a group called Fancy Ketchup, every now and then there'd be a sketch where you had to eat like a sandwich. And a running gag was to make a terrible sandwich, like a butter sandwich with sugar or whatever. And if Jim would always volunteer, which was funny, because when we go over props, Jim would say, I got all food. And to his credit, he worked in a restaurant for a long, long time. Yeah. So I was like, okay, he'll let me at least make something 
edible. So it I might will, not be good, or and it definitely won't be good for me, but at least I'll be able to bite it. Because it's basically, he's writing a joke sandwich for me, and I get the punchline when I take a bite. Right. And I, and I was kind of on board. I was like, all right, let's see what happens. Because And it would just be some ridiculous sandwich. Yeah, like butter, oh. butter and sugar, something dumb. Yeah, not something you'd make for yourself necessarily. <laughs> Although, to be honest... If you look at my teeth, clearly I've made some butter sandwiches. <laughs> well, that, I describe it as so, not something you'd made for yourself, but something you might make for your pet. Right. Exactly. It's something your pet would enjoy, and it wouldn't hurt them. So doing live comedy, we would do this bit where I just make an insane sandwich for this scene where Paul happened to need to eat a sandwich. And I, as hard as it is to believe, there were a lot of sketches where I was eating Paul's sandwiches. Paul's eating a fucking sandwich. Uh... Well, Sometimes sorry. that was the whole joke. And, and nearly two thirds of them were scripted. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> one, time, one time we're talking about Paul being fat or whatever, because we're trying to be good friends. And uh, Tim goes, yeah, Paul likes sandwiches. And Paul goes, who doesn't like sandwiches? <laughs> we uh, all do. So we're doing a sketch and the premise of the sketch is it's an election sketch and Paul's a Canadian criminal under 35 who's running for president. <laughs> I, I don't qualify in any way, and but I'm famous because I was on a reality show. Yeah. That's the sketch. Prescient. Uh, <laughs> right? Um, wow. So I tell Walker, I said, so at this point, Walk, um, Paul has to eat a sandwich. So I always make some crazy sandwich, some bad sandwich. Did not give him nearly enough instruction. No. Bad <laughs> sandwich was not, not it's, the instruction it's like that he, he took needed. like olive brine and peanut butter and a poop or whatever. He, just, he then, said literally he just took a bunch of shit out of his fridge and yep. put it on bread. <laughs> and Paul. Oh. It was and the worst. If you were in the audience, what you heard when Paul went backstage is, God damn it, who made that fucking shit? That's so funny. You know how funny it is, Paul? I'm going to tell you how funny it is. You just brought it up. I had lunch with Walker yesterday. That came up. <laughs> the thing is, uh, it worked out perfectly because that was the last sketch, and, and me taking a bite of the sandwich was the end of the sketch. Yes. The loons dropped, and we played music, and it was like a big, you know, uh, we hope he wins things. But once I took a bite, I almost spit it out and I stopped myself and I forced myself to swallow it, but I was done after that. I was no longer acting or trying to be funny or even entertaining. And I looked around as if to, I wanted to see who was laughing because I was going to murder them. And so I went backstage and just like Jim said, who the fuck made this shit ass sandwich to try to poison me? And I got to say, it, the matter you got, the funnier it got because well, of course was so it was so out of proportion now and that was, was the last time i ever ate a sandwich on stage i hope you're happy jim it's <laughs> another thing about me you've ruined like my tom jones impression it's pretty pretty happy i did all not, right uh, i gotta tell you a funny story about our podcast though i gotta tell you something funny that this one we're laugh. doing right now yes okay it made me laugh all week and i talked about it with tom so last friday we were going to do the podcast last Friday, but Paul goes, <laughs> I haven't had time to prepare. And the idea that there's, you need time to prepare for this fucking show <laughs> made me laugh so fucking hard that I we had lunch together the next day. I was like, hey, just out of curiosity, what do you think Paul does before the show? That was so funny to me. <laughs> Cause I'm like, you guys have no idea the amount of prep work I put in. This, this is thing. like, I've just got to imagine that you're actually bald. You don't have a beard. <laughs> <laughs> it's all image. Yeah. That's, that's why all my comedy is so half-assed. I'm so tired you're, from fucking preparation. Your wife, your wife normally has you in this thing that's oxygenated because you're mostly just a skull and you're like, okay, put on the skin. <laughs> I've been bald since before Beat the Geeks. You bald, I've spent you every penny I've ever made in show business. I've spent on wigs and hair dye. Yeah. Before we um, let I'm, me let me let me get to the trivia question. Talking about talking about Canada. 
uh, I was saying shits at late in the past, maybe 10 years, Shits Creek is a perfect example of this Canadian television boom that has happened. Uh, because for a long time, Cana Canadian TV and radio, whatever is hamstrung by CanCon, yeah. uh, which is Canadian content. But now because creators can take more control, um, it's easier to work the CanCon because you don't have to take other people say you have to work with these Canadians. And I mean, and in Schitt's Creek, it's a great example because obviously is uh, there's three Canadians who are related to each other on the show. And, and then they're also the producers and the writers and the directors. So it works out, but it's a perfect example of how in the last few years, there've been some really excellent shows coming out of Canada that aren't necessarily Canadian based. I mean, Schitt's Creek, could honestly be happening anywhere if it wasn't for the fact that they say, oh, you'd probably never know it was Canada. But uh, like um, there's a sketch show called the Baroness Von Sketch Show, which is four funny women. It's basically like kids in a hall, except it's four women. Sure. Uh, and we watch that all the time. It's really fucking good. And uh, I was reading this article about like, it was like the top 50 underrated sitcoms. And of course I see a list like that and I go, do your best list. Uh, and so I start reading it and I'm like, seen it, seen it, sucks, seen it, sucks, sucks, seen it. And I literally get all the way up to number one, having seen every one of these sitcoms. And number one is called Working Moms. I'd never fucking heard of it before. Oh. And I Google it. And it's a show about uh, these women who have kids and they balance, blah, blah, blah. But it's just a typical sitcom at the end of the day. But it is so Canadian, it stars and is created and written by Catherine Reitman, who of course is Ivan Reitman's daughter, Jason's sister. Um, and she was on Philadelphia. She had a recurring character on Philadelphia. Uh, but it's really fucking funny. And it's been on for like eight seasons. It's been on forever. And I feel like a bigger dick that I hadn't heard about it for so long. But I want to uh, tell everybody that they should go watch it. And in my research for uh, looking at these Canadian shows, I was looking at Kids in the Hall, of course, and how uh, comedy-wise, Canada has really been like the gem of, I want to say American comedy, because every, it's like Americans' favorite comedies and comics basically all come from Canada. SCTV, Kids in the Hall, uh, fucking Wayne, Wayne's World, you know, Mike Myers. And then, and then I looked at other shows like the Lauren and Hart Hour, which was a, a, a variety show that Lauren Michaels did with this guy Hart Pomerantz before he came to America. So it really, there was like a, this deep embedding of comedy in Canada that exploded. But the question this week is about Wayne Campbell. Um, All right. The you know, the character Wayne Campbell, Mike Myers, he, uh, he did not appear first on SNL. So the question is, what was the name of the first TV show that Wayne Campbell appeared on? Mike Myers as Wayne Campbell appeared on a show before he appeared on SNL. So do you guys have a guess what it is? I do. Uh, the Canadian Potted Meat Hour. <laughs> Good question. And it's just as likely that that's a real show considering uh, their dumb titles, but not correct. The funny Tom, thing is, never mind. Oh. Okay. I was going to say that I saw a clip of the original, but I don't remember what I saw. It was just a short bit on a show. I don't even know if it was a regular segment. Do you have a guess, Tom? Uh, no. <laughs> it would be a wild guess because I know you guys have never heard of this show. All right. Yeah. So if you, uh, if you are a listener and you, want, you think you know or you just want to Google it and send me the answer, go ahead and send it to me somehow through Facebook Messenger or whatever. I can still get messages even though I'm in Facebook jail. But send me the answer and you might get a prize. Uh, Truman Cadness was the last guy who got the answer correct and he was able to play my game show. Uh, and we all know what a great prize that is, right? Mm -hmm. uh, oh, by the way, speaking of my game show, if you want to, uh, the next show is on uh, the uh, 7th of October. Uh, and I have Matt Kirshen, Lily Von Stupp, Andy Blitz, and Wayne Fetterman all booked. Damn, that that's a show, son. Right, that should be a very funny show. I'm very excited. I don't normally do this, but let me know and I'll, I'll uh, pimp it. <laughs> all right, perfect. But w will you watch it? That's the question. Yeah, I'll watch it. Yeah. Sweet. All right, so let's talk about Wait, a big quick. deal. I got to say about the Emmys one more time. Oh, okay. We neglected something. What? It's 
absolutely fantastic that Captain O'Hara won an award. And it is absolutely fantastic that a brilliant comedic actress of her age has a significant role on television. That's a big deal. I agree. And I had the pleasure of meeting her one time. And she's the nicest lady. And I think the fact that I wanted to talk about Lola Heatherton made her day because yeah. she stopped and talked to me instead of going, oh, yeah, yeah. She was like, because I just thought Lola Heatherton was a great character from SCTV. Yeah, she's way too nice. Well, you know, famously, she was supposed to be a cast member on SNL. And when she showed up, Michael O'Donohue was running around yelling, being Michael O'Donohue. And she literally turned around and drove back to Canada. That's so awesome. she was... Yeah, she was not interested in yeah, any of that she, nonsense. Her acceptance speech was gracious and kind. Um, and it makes me just so happy to see her continue to be success, successful. Although, sure. you know, um, Catherine O'Hara and, um, well, I'm blanking on her name, but the other major lady. Andrea Martin. Andrea Martin, whenever I, see, I saw her, you know, she won a Tony not that long ago. Yeah. And those kind of things just make me happy because those two ladies are about some of the most brilliant women in acting and comedy absolutely period. just i'm delighted that a part exists for her so and uh uh i, I will tell you uh we also brooke and i also met Catherine o'hara when uh we went up to toronto to visit some friends she was on a plane and we got off and brooke was like oh Catherine o'hara was on our plane and then when we were going back she was on the same plane coming back to la She's probably pretty, pretty frazzled on the ride back though right <laughs> Well, she, uh, but we see her in the gate and Brooke's like, uh, hey, look, there's Catherine O'Hara again. And of course, you know, my wife is Canadian and Catherine, she, she had a party when she was a kid where everybody dressed up like Bob and Doug McKenzie. So, you know, she's, she has a long history watching SCTV. She's so she's like, awesome. wow. And so I go, well, you should go talk to her because what are the chances you'll get to meet her ever again? And Brooke, of course, you know, who's very polite had to be talked into just saying hello. And I was like, come on, I'll go with you. So I basically bullied her into walking over and I said, hi, Catherine, my name's Paul. This is my wife, Brooke, she's Canadian. We love you. We've been growing up watching you for so long. You're amazing. And of course she was very nice, like you thought. And I said, can we get a picture? And then we won't bother you. And I took a picture of her and Brooke and she said, now don't put that on the internet <laughs> because she looked like she was getting ready to board a plane. And we never did but we still have that gorgeous picture of the two of them. Uh, and I think about it all the time. Tom, do you want to tell a story when you met Catherine O'Hara? Oh, it was so good. Uh, I, was, I was walking down the street and she was running the other way because she had just robbed a bank. Whoa. Oh. I know, no, this story never got out. Nobody ever heard about this because she killed all the witnesses. Oh, that's funny. Dang. I, I don't get it, but. It's I guess nice it's a good that, you know, women of a certain age can do anything they want. That's right. We, sisters are doing it for right. themselves. Yeah. All right. Let's move on to our uh, last, at least my last topic. Uh, the uh, nerd and animation world suffered a great blow because they announced that uh, not just that it's canceled, but the Venture Brothers is done and won't be coming back. Um, and I'm not a huge fan. I came to it later well, and, I, and I watched it, but it, it was a big deal. So what's your reaction? Obviously, Tom, you have something to say. Well, they, they, they announced that it was, well, apparently they canceled it. They didn't, they didn't announce it. And then six months later, it finally came out that it was canceled. I and see. then when it came out and everybody was upset, then Adult Swim kind of, they did kind of walk it back. They said well, I, that- I, I have a feeling that might've been the point. They, they might've wanted to see what the reaction was, but I also think they got the exact reaction they, they thought they were gonna get as well. You know, it's not like everybody lost their mind, but a good handful of people were upset. And I agree, it's bullshit just to cancel a show and not tell anybody and not have a final, at least not a final episode, you know? That, yeah. That's kind of fun, but, especially well, for a show with such a big fan base. I mean, I love the Venture Brothers, but I, I've i been telling myself not to panic about any of this because they did... <laughs> because, for I mean, for one thing, they did... As soon as the story broke, Adult Swim was like, we're looking for a way for them to keep telling this story somehow. Like they, they made a very vague statement, but it, it left open the idea that it could continue in some other form somewhere else. And there is precedent, there's multiple precedents at this point for Turner shows moving to HBO Max. Ah, yes, that is a good point. Um, Cause it could move to HBO and don't call me Max. No, but that's a good point. 
uh, I recently just was able to watch HBO Max. I watched the uh, third season of Search Party. Holy shit, was that amazing. Yeah. I fucking loved it. But you're right, because that's, uh, because it seems to me, it's it, it's only been around for a while, but uh, w- when HBO first started doing original programming, they were like the jewel. They were like the what everybody aspired to with the best the best shows, the best acting, you know, and plus they could say the F word and show boobs. And I feel like, you know, now everyone's kind of caught up to that. And HBO Max is now what that is. Now HBO Max is where you put the, like where Seth Rogen wants to put his pickle movie and where you got to go to see special shit. Because eventually that's, it's just going to be HBO Max. They will get rid of HBO Go and HBO Now and HBO probably. Um, And it will all be on that. But I have a feeling then, yeah, that will be like some kind of uh like gold standard uh but now but you you guys get that for free right well i i do subscribe to hbo so i get it with my hbo subscription okay so i as uh, well okay yeah because i pay for hbo i pay for hbo now i think because i don't have cable but i can chromecast hbo max Mm -hmm. and watch anything on that and everybody else pays for your bo (laughs) Um, but I think, but that's a good point. Um, I, I don't know that the budget would be the same. I guess they don't have much of a budget on Adult yeah. Swim either. They, so. There's no way they had uh, Adult Swim doesn't have a budget for anything. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't think that that would be a big worry. So yeah, but there's know, already, like there's already been a fit. couple of Cartoon Network shows that have moved to HBO Max. They're doing the, the Adventure Time specials at HBO Max. Uh, Infinity Train and, and Summer Camp Island moved full time to HBO Max. They're HBO Max shows now. The BMO um, show is on that. Yeah. Uh, so and then, yeah, you know, and then Search. It's a different Turner Network with Search Party, like we said, moved to HBO so, Max. So there's already sort of a pipeline there. Yeah. So that's that's a I, I, now what might be a slight complication is that I believe it, Venture Brothers is currently on Hulu, but I who knows what, what, if that's an exclusive contract or what, but. Yeah, so what I was going to say is that for anybody who's listening and that hasn't seen... So nobody. Yeah, but that hasn't seen the Venture Brothers, if you haven't seen the Venture Brothers, now's actually a pretty good time to binge it and understand why people love it so much because every season's on Hulu. I was just re-watching some of my favorite episodes, being nostalgic and sad that the show might be gone, and watching Hank in the Jungle eating coffee bean, beans and then becoming ridiculously capable is such brilliant storytelling. And the whole thing with the uh, Murphy bed thing is ridiculous. The Murphy and, bed is one of my favorite gags in the show. Yeah, yeah. and that, that entire thing. Um, and for those who don't know, they do the best, they do the best, I think, period of satirizing something you've seen satirized before but you haven't seen it taken apart this way. The, <laughs> my prototypical example is the Scooby-Doo gang in Venture Brothers. I promise you've seen a thousand different jokes about the Scooby-Doo gang. You haven't seen this one. And this one says so much about the show and it makes sense within the world. I do hope it comes back. If it doesn't, I wouldn't be surprised because man, there's a long time between seasons just because of the way the show works. Yeah, I will say it, uh, you know, I started watching it much later than you guys did. And I, and I did binge like the whole first and second season. And I think the show suffers because it has such a deep backstory and all these characters and it suffers by having so much time in between. And I know that uh, there, I'm sure there are people who were like, oh, right, the Venture Brothers, I used to watch that. You know, and you just forget about it when it comes back because uh, there's there's uh, when it's like it's, it's like you get to take a break from it and you don't want to necessarily dive back in. So I, I think it suffers from that. But yeah, maybe uh, doing doing a bunch of episodes all at once, releasing them all at once, you know, on HBO Max is the way to go, because that's one of the reasons I liked so, this search party so much, because I watched every episode kind of, you know, in two days and it was fucking great when and it's better. Uh, I think we've talked about this before, this new trend of uh, half hour shows that you can binge is really fucking cool because you can get through a whole season in two days. It's Mm. great. 
You know, you're watching 20 minutes at a time. It's fucking good. Um, but what, what, as, as super fans of the show, what are your hopes? What are ultimately, I mean, if you, if you could have exactly what you want regarding the Venture Brothers, what would it be? Tom, you start. Well, pie in the sky, exactly what I want. I, 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 would, I would love for somebody like say an HBO Max who recognizes an opportunity here to have sort of a, a prestige animated show if they want to get their foot in the door with a particular audience to say, okay, here's a blank check. Make as many as you want. Keep doing it for as long as you want. Um, now, because now they, would it, keep, they'll, they would keep doing it forever. Is HBO Max your preferred platform if you had your choice? Um, I mean, I don't think I have a... Pre- I don't, I don't know. I'm if saying I'm if you could, if, if you could put it on any network at all, any place, where would you prefer to see it? I think that one makes sense. Um, I do too. I'm, I'm not mad about it being on Hulu because I also have Hulu, but, um, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah obviously but I would like, I would on. like Hulu or HBO max, or I think HBO max makes sense given, um, just given the, the business relationships that they already have. And given the fact that this is already a Turner property, like yeah. it, it that that's the natural path i think but i would okay. like i would like somebody who wants a prestige program and not not necessarily one that's going to be a smash hit but one that is going to get press anytime there's a new series anytime there's a new season like every yep. review site is reviewing it and yeah and, and the it, animation fans come out of the woodwork and go oh good more venture brothers so if yeah. you want if you want a prestige sort of flagship program to get into the adult animation audience Here's one. Here's one tailor made that has that has a cult following and and critical adulation already. So pick it up. Let them keep making it as long as they're interested. They're interested. <laughs> right, right. And you know, and uh, HBO Max could conceivably do things that Adult Swim never did: behind the scenes, featurettes, whatever. Go to Comic Con and talk to all the nerds there. They and, they, and let's be real: it was an Adult Swim show. It wasn't expensive because it's Adult Swim. Adult Swim just does not have that much money. We know ultimately. The other thing too is if it was on HBO Max, if their budget was high enough, you could get the seasons sooner. Maybe a little, but we got to remember, we got to remember that Doc and and Jackson do pretty much everything, right? They're involved in like every step. They write the whole show themselves. And they're involved in overseeing the animation and doing the the music and the the or the the editing and the sound design and all. And they're involved in like every step so heavily. Yeah. That, that is that is so. There's that's a limiting factor. And then the other limiting factor is that animation just takes a long time to do. And yeah. and then and then Adult Swim historically doesn't always move quickly. So Adult Swim would let a whole <laughs> season play out and then wait a while and then and then renew them but then it takes like two years to deliver a new season and and we've already had you know several months off before they make that decision so like you could cut some of that down but if it's going to be the same show and it's going to so much of it it's going to come down to jackson and doc then yeah yeah yeah, you're that's that's always going to be a limiting factor i find i I find it funny that there's a show like the venture brothers where two guys do everything and it's really good and they don't have a lot of money and they didn't license the shit out of it And everybody, and it's, you know, it's, it's prestige. And then there's another cartoon that two dipshits make. They live in Hawaii. They made a million dollars off of it and are still making a million dollars. It's in its gazillion season, but because it's so easy to animate, it's not a problem. You know, I'm talking about South Park, obviously, which, which, which people love, but the shows could not be more different in tone, in production in everything, I, I, I find that so funny. Here's, uh, here's something I find funny that now that you bring that up. So the Venture Brothers, they announced the Venture Brothers is canceled. It's obviously very uh, sad. Doc and Jackson make little announcements on Twitter. And I, and I read some of the comments and there was this outraged fan who's just mad. And, he, and his point is, he goes, the Venture Brothers is great Rick and Morty sucks. <laughs> Out of nowhere. <laughs> and it was, it's perfectly, perfectly expresses the idiocy, idiocy that can be fandom because, well, Rick and Morty doesn't suck. It's just a different show. You could as <laughs> easily had said, like, if I had posted, you're canceling Venture Brothers. 
but Shit's Creek wins all these Emmys. <laughs> and it makes just as much sense. Anything. Oh, but Shark Tank is in its 11th season, right? Yeah. That's fair. <laughs> and also, anytime you use the word fair in reference to television, my God. I, I, I told I, my I kids when they were little, fair only applies to board games. That's it. Sports and board games. It and doesn't hair. apply to anything else. It applies to hair and skin. Well, it's a different word then, but yes. Yeah, uh, all right. I, I don't have any more topics. Do you guys want to talk about anything else? Can I tell you a funny story? Mm, I don't think you can, but I'm sure you'll try. <laughs> so I was doing one of them, their uh, Zoom comedy shows. By the way, have you done sit stand up on Zoom yet, Paul? No, I, I'm, I'm doing my own show, which gives me an excuse not to do stand-up on Zoom. Nice, nice. Well, when the, when the pandemic's over, you can also <laughs> try Zoom, uh, comedy. Oh, life. wait, time out. I'm sorry, time out. You just reminded me of a joke I had that I want to tell you guys. Oh, but uh, Because I do jokes on my show every once in a while, uh, so I don't need to do stand-up. But here's a joke I wrote, uh, I did on my show, but I, you guys will like it. You know, uh, uh, stop me if you've heard this one, but you know how in uh, the, fo the founding fathers used to wear those tight pants and you could see all their junk and stuff like Ben Franklin and Thomas Jefferson, those guys used to wear the jodhpurs, whatever, you know what I'm talking about? Sure. Sometimes you could see their, their, you know, their sexual organs and they had a term for that. You know what they called it? What? Hamilton. <laughs> right? Here's the thing. I norm, I more or less always despise it when you do things like that. And and I still do, but that one's pretty good. That's a great fucking joke. What's funny is I was playing poker with all those guys, you know, uh, that I play poker with, Chip and those guys. And I knew, I said it, and I knew they were not going to give me anything, of course, because they refused. But Bill Dwyer laughed his ass off, which I found very funny. Like, Bill was nice enough to go, oh, that's very clever, Paul. I'm, is this a Zoom poker game? Yeah, yeah, we play via Zoom on uh, once a week. It's pretty fun. That's funny, old Bill Dwyer. I've done a few shows with him now in Zoom. I enjoy, I enjoy him quite a lot. Ah, uh, he's he's. That's one of the reasons I play poker because Bill plays because it's super fun. He's so fucking loud and he yells about shit and it makes me laugh every time. So I, okay, so I've done a few of the stand -em, stand -em up shows where you're on <laughs> Zoom and and so one of the things that has happened is. Certain people have decided that Zooms, when they're going to try stand-up the first time, which is weird. Ah, perfect, yeah. That's so weird. And you'll see somebody will be doing Zoom, and they'll have written their jokes down, and they're going like this. <laughs> and so you're like, okay, so I always want to know, why did you want to do this? Like, I was saying to Allie, I was like, like, if you told me you liked, you wanted to get into horror films, and I was like, oh, so you like horror films? And you went, no, I hate scary movies. <laughs> like because it doesn't make sense to me that you're shy or whatever but anyway i do them anyway and some of the comics are hilarious i was doing this joke and i'm going to preface this by saying that i did a thing that i think paul likes which is i did this joke and because you can watch people's faces i progressively saw one person in the room get mad at me <laughs> yeah. Perfect. And normally, I just want people to enjoy the show. But in this particular case, I was like, oh, that's awesome. So I'll tell you the joke. Um, okay. I, uh, I want to do more political comedy. I want to get more into political comedy because it's the hot thing. People are doing political jokes. But also, I don't know nothing about politics, and I don't want to learn stuff. So I'm just going to become a libertarian. I don't know if you know what a libertarian is. A libertarian is a guy who don't know fuck all about nothing but won't <laughs> shut up about anything. That's what a libertarian is. A libertarian is the guy, if you're out with 20 people having dinner and it's time to pay the check, he's the guy that goes, oh, you guys got this? That's a fucking libertarian. <laughs> hey, libertarians, pot's almost legal. You guys are done. <laughs> that was the only cogent opinion you had. And then I just watched this guy's face because he was having a good time and he was even pretty funny. Just kind of go. <laughs> It's so great when people think they're on your side and then you go, you know what? I'm, I, I don't have sides. I'm not on anyone's side. <laughs> that happened to me once. I, I said something about Bernie supporters. I made a joke about, you know, when Bernie dropped out, made a joke about Bernie supporters who are still going to vote for him. And a lot of people who were, supported things I used to say 
came out and said, no, nah, you're full of shit. You're an asshole. <laughs> I'm like, bro, we were agreeing on all the anti-Trump stuff, but Bernie's done. And you, now I'm a dick. Okay. But also, here's what I'll say the difference is, and I would have said this to this person if I, wa- if I cared. I would have <laughs> said, look, I'm making jokes about libertarians, which means I don't hate libertarians. Right. I don't make Trump jokes. I don't make Republican jokes because I don't find it any, anywhere funny. Libertarians, I think, are misguided and off. Like the other joke I made is, uh, I have a friend who recently told me uh, they're a libertarian. I used to think they were kind of stupid. It's nice to get confirmation. <laughs> yes, I saw you. <laughs> you tweeted that. That uh, was very. That's very funny. Yeah, I mean, we've known you know Graham Elwood uh, for a long, long time, and he has always claimed to be a libertarian. And it's funny because yeah. back in maybe in the '80s and even part of the '90s. I think that was perfectly appropriate to be a libertarian because people would go, what does that mean? And they'd go, you should be able to do whatever you want as long as it doesn't hurt anyone else, which is a perfectly fine thing to believe if you don't have kids. Uh, But of course, there's no libertarians who have kids because uh, libertarianism doesn't protect children. Um, But now that fucking, even libertarianism is outdated. That shit is done. Also, I, the other thing I always think is, how do libertarian? Where do libertarians think roads come from? They yeah, look right out the window and go, wow, nature is amazing. Nature is just amazing. The God's earth produces yep. the most amazing things. Electricity, roads, remember water when, into my house. Remember when the internet started growing? <laughs> That's the thing. Anyone who's a true libertarian has no need for American government, right? Yeah. If you live off, like the fucking Unabomber, he was a true libertarian. He lived off the grid by himself. He made just enough money to support himself. Didn't bother anyone else until that day. Yeah. Of the, course. The only true fucking libertarians are polar bears. That's it. <laughs> They're true libertarians. They'll eat your young. And, and their own and their own and uh and but what about what about they chimps like they eat their own babies they like coca-colas too who chimpanzees eat their own babies yeah that's true and they're oh, they I, are very similar to libertarians i'm gonna tell tom so irritating i got another postcard <laughs> did you yeah chimpanzees oh. wow wow that that is who is, is it addressed to talk. me <laughs> Uh, did you guys watch that end of summer concert? Uh, no, no, I didn't. I would have if I liked any of the other bands, but you like Toad the Wet Sprocket, don't you, Tom? Um, I, I'm indifferent. Oh, okay. Yeah, if it was like that one we saw where I only hated one of the bands, I would have totally paid and watched it. But... I'm not, I know you're not on a dating website, Tom, but if you were, I'm indifferent is your profile. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, that's perfect. Is there anything else we want to talk about then? Or should uh, we, we should let Jim send us home? What everybody's talking about. Uh, did I All do right. the dumb things I was going to do? Yeah. All right. Uh, Tom, you're good? Well, wait a minute. Is he going to do his, his oh, shit? Yeah. yeah, he's going to yeah. do a thing. I just want to make sure it's the last thing we do. Oh, I'm well, generally... then no, I'm not good. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean last thing we ever do. Oh. Because I've, oh. I've sent assassins <laughs> to your houses. Uh, Finally. <laughs> when this and when as soon as Jim completes his mashup, you'll hear a glass breaking and the sound of a silencer. All right. All right. Hit it. That's my that was that's my uh favorite old song, by the way. Uh, uh, the following takes place between eight o'clock and eight oh five. I can't believe we got canceled and I'm a ghost. Uh and also Dean was there. Uh, not Deborah. Right, but Dean. Yeah, you're not Ray Romano. We get that. No, but the yeah. following takes place between 8 and 8.05. Yeah, 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 like that TV this, show. I yeah, think the, I, yeah, I think we get it, Tom. It, it's Henchman 24. Now, 
I got the, the you. character Henchman 24 from the Venture Brothers and the sh- and a vague reference to the television program. Vague reference. 24. <laughs> I got to tell you, before we leave, this is even funnier. This is how wrong I was about to do that bit. Are you ready? Yeah. I Luckily, I realized my error, but normally I screw up references. So this was going to be my original impression. Uh, this is for the... Recently deceased show Venture Brothers. Bang! 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 I was going to do a 21 gun salute, which would be absolutely wrong. Wow. And and we'd have to listen to it for a long time. (laughs) Because you'd be doing that 21 times. Not on reflection, I should have done it. That reminds me of one of your earliest mashups when we first started doing the show. Uh, one of the first ones you ever did was Jack Bowser. <laughs> right. But it but it was Bowser from uh, Mario Brothers, not from Sha Na Na. Oh man, I missed the trick there because it should have been Jack Bowser. I like Jack Bowser from Sha Na Na. Do, 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 do. <laughs> All right, uh, that was pretty funny. Okay, anything else we want to talk about before uh, we let it go? Uh, my thing, every two weeks I do my game show on my Twitch channel, which is twitch.tv slash thekingotv. The next one is October 7th. Oh, I actually do have a new podcast to promote, which will be dropping soon. Uh, it's me and Jeremy Paul, and it's uh, Bad Science, Good Science. And we just talk about bad what... Bad Science, Good Science. And we just talk about what constitutes good science and bad science. And now that we've done, because we've done like six episodes, we'll drop them all kind of at once. And uh, uh, just a spoiler, we are not qualified to talk about this. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think people knew that considering you were on the show. Uh, Tom, you got want anything to say? Any uh, predictions? You want to throw out some of your famous Tom predicts? Yes, do this, Tom. Tom predicts. Do it. This is probably my new favorite segment, Tom predicts. I predict this will be a short segment. Ow! And it came true. Holy shit! He did it. Once again, Tom Griffin predicts. All right. Uh, That is the show. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Thank you guys for being here. Uh, We're going to go fuck ourselves. Goodbye, everybody.